Oh, hello, good morning, everyone. It is so good to see you here this morning. If you are out in the foyer, do come on in. We have come to worship this morning. So forget about the coffee and come on in. We're gonna worship King Jesus. But just to say also a massive welcome if you're new, if you're visiting, if you're seeing if this is where you wanna get planted. We would love to invite you along to our Connect evening, which is the best place to hear about church, hear about our story and how you can get involved. So that is on the 11th of March, but head out to the Connect desk after the service and they will let you know all about that. But we're gonna worship King Jesus, so why don't you stand to your feet, welcome the person next to you this morning, welcome them into the house of the Lord. And come and fill the space, step out into the aisles, into the front. The Lord says, draw near to Him and He will draw near to you. This is why we step out into the Lord. We step out. We don't want to hold anything back. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy. And this week I have been camped in Psalm 34. Do you ever do that where you just get stuck in one place and you keep reading it over and over again and the Lord just reveals more of Him? So I just want to Read some of Psalm 34 over us before it sets, we start. And it says this, I sought the Lord and He answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to Him are radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man cried and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear Him and rescue them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. How happy is the person who takes refuge in Him. You are His holy ones, fear the Lord. For those who fear Him lack nothing. Young lions lack food and go hungry, but those that seek the Lord lack no good thing. And the Lord is our sustainer. It is in Him that we find everything. He is our salvation. He is our joy. He is the glory. And this morning, as we, as we look to Him, our only response is worship. Our only response is to give Him the adoration. So where you're at, why don't you just put your hands out, lift them up and just begin to declare His goodness. Thank Him for who He is. Thank Him for what He's done in your life. In Him, you lack nothing. He is our sustainer. Lord, we look to You. We look to You and You promise that we will be radiant with Your joy. So Lord, as we worship You this morning, would You pour out Your glory afresh? Would You pour out Your goodness? And would we be radiant for You? For You are worthy. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy.
shine on us, King Jesus. Come and rest on your people.
Spirit, blow through this place. Fill our lives. Let the joy of Jesus be in this place. Fill in our hearts to overflowing. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. Fill us. Fill us, Lord. Every single person here. Your love and your goodness on our lives. Fill us, Lord. Lord, we breathe in your breath, your spirit. Fill us, Lord. sort of exhortation he was breathing down on us the breath of heaven and I saw the breath of heaven coming to earth and you know that picture is twofold many of us have reached out and touched the hem of his garment some of us need to touch the hem of his garment today to seek him for our healing and just in this moment as we worship the Lord I just want to encourage you to do that if you know you need to reach out and touch the Lord and ask Him for something, see that He is dancing over us. The dancing hand of God, His Holy Spirit. And there is this breath of heaven that brings the new mercies of God. And if you need a fresh touch of God, listen, we come and we worship Him to love Him, to give something to Him. But when He comes, we can hold out our hands. We can receive the breath of heaven. So you know who you are, who need that touch, to touch the hem of His garment and receive the breath of heaven. Holy Spirit, come. Breathe on us, God. Let us receive your new life. Lord, in those dry and barren places, those places of weariness, breathe on us, God. Let the freedom come that we need, the release, the freedom. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Lord. Let us receive your new breath, the breath of heaven. Let us touch the hem of your garment be set free. Heal our bodies, God. Come, Lord. Come, Lord. We love you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Now we're going to go back into worship, but we're going to make a little space in the middle. Don't go away because you're going to worship around them. But if you're here this morning and you're sick in any way, come on down, just in the middle here. And we're going to pray. And the Spirit of God's going to come and release His healing power. So if it's interesting, Jesus, and they bring a, 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 a deaf and mute man to Him. And I, I, love, I love it that he, he takes Him out of the crowd 
Because sometimes when we're in the crowd and our, our sickness can be, just become a friend. And what the man needed was a face-to-face -face with Jesus. And Jesus spits on the floor and makes a, um, a, a, a pace, puts his fingers in his ears, touches his tongue. But the, the, and the man is healed. And the, the Gospels say the people were amazed because he did everything well. And so right in this moment, the one who does everything well, the lover of our souls is here. And, and particularly if you've got a, a, a speech impediment, if I'm, I'm, I was really just thinking of people with memory and anything to do with the, the, the brain or with hearing, come on down. If you've got a long-term diagnosis, come on down. There's more of you. Come on, come on forward. This is a healing environment. And we're gonna stand in the presence of God. It's in His presence that we, we receive our healing. So come on down, come on. And then the rest of us, we're just gonna go right back into worship. Lord, we welcome the healing spirit, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals us. side top of your thigh come on down who is like you who would even come close where can I
Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. I can never look away. these bodies in the name of Jesus. Pain go in the name of Jesus Christ. Organs that be, re be renewed, be restored in the name of Jesus. Hearing restored, hearing restored. The conditions of the mind, tumours reducing, dissolving. The Creator God, He changes things by a word. We welcome you, Jesus. or even if you didn't come forward and you're saying, just check it out. Just check if you had pain in your body and don't, don't go yet. If you came forward, the Lord hasn't finished yet. We found, sometimes we will run off too quick. <laughs> He's still working. So just check it out. Just see if there's some change. Move things around. Uh, Tim, Joel, Rachel should have a microphone somewhere. Give us a wave. What's going on? <laughs> Steve called out, and how much pain were you in? Oh, it wasn't mega pain, but it was niggling all the time. Okay, yeah. okay cool. And so all the pain is completely gone, even when you bounce? <laughs> okay. <laughs> when you bounce, you can... <laughs> I oh, love it. Thank you, Jesus. You're, you're in the right church to bounce. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What else? Give it a check out. Come on. What's the Lord doing? But someone, I think you, again, you had stomach pain, cramps in your stomach, and I think they've gone. Where are you? And it might not feel like a big thing, but where, where are you? Who's the wave? You, who's the person with the stomach cramps and they've, they've gone? Where are you? Blow your cover. There, there, someone. Come on. So it 
does make sense. So Lorna, you were skiing, you injured your knee, and then you watched Chroma live stream, and then you were, and we, you prayed for your own knee, or someone prayed for your own knee while you were in the healing ministry last week on live stream, and you actually were able to ski after that. And <laughs> I mean, it's pretty powerful, even over the internet, it's amazing. Um, and and actually, you're noticing more and more release of the knee even today as well. Did I summarise that well? Perfect. So we're going to pray for a complete release. Is that okay with you? Jesus, thank you, God, that you are omnipresent and you are skiing and you're in Leicester. And God, I ask now that you will come and release your full gamut of healing. Thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes, we're not just partially healed or a little bit healed. We're completely healed. And we speak the grace and the peace of Jesus Christ over this knee. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Anyone else? What's going on? ago sorry and you've been to a mammogram and you've had it tested and there's absolutely nothing there thank you Jesus that is absolutely thank amazing you, Lord. thank you Lord and and you felt in the morning of the mammogram you actually felt it and then you went to the mammogram and nothing came up on the scan thank you Jesus thank you Jesus there you go Okay, if you're here this morning and you've got a, 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 a lump somewhere that you don't think should be there, just discreetly put your hand where it is. Now, Lord Jesus, we ask that You would, you would um, move in this room and we command the, the lumps, the cysts, the, the, the fatty collections, whatever they, they are, the tumours, to dissolve now in the Name of Jesus and that they would all... So Lord, we, we pray that the fear would lift off and these lumps would dissolve because we are in the presence of the living God. In the Name of Jesus and everyone said, Amen. Why don't you go and find a seat if you can. We're going to take up our offering and then I'm going to introduce our guests to you. Um, giving here is, is as much uh, an importance to us as the, the singing, the dancing. We, we believe that we bring the first fruits of all of the goodness that God has put into our lives. We bring them to Him. And as we bring them to Him, He blesses and He multiplies. And it's, it's not even so we get more, it's so we become more generous. So there's a sense of, of we give to get, to give, to get, so that there is a freedom in our finances and all that, um, that He has done in our lives. So there is a flow. It's not about accumulating. It's about giving thanks from everything He's given us and allowing the goodness of God to flow from us to others. So why don't you stand up? We're going to say a declaration. If you want to know how to give, you can give by the envelopes, you can give in the baskets. There's a QR code on the back, on the top of your chair that you can scan or you can scan that one if your phone will reach. 
Um, but right now, we're gonna make a declaration of the goodness of God in our life. Are you set? Five of you. Yeah, okay, okay, we're there. <laughs> As we take up this offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, favour and friendships, an open door for the Gospel, blessings at work, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, estates and inheritances, miraculous provision, interests and income, tax rebates and returns, checks in the post, gifts and surprises, finding money, debts paid off, expenses decrease, blessing and increase. Thank You Lord for meeting all of my financial needs that I might have more than enough to give into the Kingdom of God and promote the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just stay standing for a moment. The basket's gonna go round. I wanna introduce our guests, Michael, Diane. Is she gonna come up? Yeah, come on up. These are our, our, our good, great friends. And they're over from um, California in the US. Do you know, about, about six or so years ago, we found ourselves in a mess, Juliet and I. And we needed people to talk to and, and just, and these, these guys didn't know us. They welcomed us into their home. They, they, they fed us. And as we took a journey, they, they gave counsel that was so helpful to us and have become great friends. Uh, they were ministering at Bethel in Redding, California. They're now with Jesus Culture in Sacramento. Um, they, they just have a lifetime of wisdom and walk in with the Lord. And I knew they were in the UK. And so he said, you've got to come to church. They were with us about five years ago at Presence and Promise, but you've, you've got to get here and come on a Sunday. So would you welcome them once more and you're in for a treat. Oh, good morning, family. It is so Good to be here, you know. It's good to see your beautiful faces shining with the glory of God. And um, I saw many of you wearing shirts seeing revival. And revival's in this place. The Spirit of the Lord is here. And when you think of being revived, you can think of somebody that's fallen on the floor and they're having a heart attack and they're passing away and they put on those, those electronic things and they give them a jolt and they're revived. You know, God is coming into our hearts in this place and he's reviving us. He's changing our minds. He's, he's opening up the perspective of heaven. We're able to see who Jesus was and who he is and what he wants to do in our lives. This year is my 51st year of following Jesus. And um, yeah, it's amazing. When I was 14 years old, I came from a non-believing family. I had friends that were older. We would drink beer, smoke pot, talk about spiritual things. And one day, um, my girlfriend and I, we went to see the movie The Exorcist. And it's a horrible movie, I don't recommend it. It's about the devil possessing a girl. But the, the amazing thing is outside that movie theater, there was a man with a card and he said, the devil's real? and God's real, and he wants to know you, come to our church. And it was a church called Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa, California, who was in the midst of revival. And we were literally, I tell people we had the, we had the hell scared out of us. We were scared to death after that movie, and we went there. And it felt like here, you guys. I walked in that place, and revival feels like this. It feels like God coming and touching you and reviving you. He brings a renaissance, it's a rebirth. And I wanna to speak to you young people in this, in this audience. He took a girl that was very wayward and lost and he's taken me all around the nations because he's given me life and he's changed my heart. And he's doing that for you. I just want to speak. You have a destiny in the nations in this place. What's happening here is going to come out. And you know, 
hundreds of thousands of people came to the Lord during that season. We can expect that here for your country in England, that, that tens of thousands of people will come to and through this place and you're gonna lay hands on them and you're gonna see them recover and you're gonna see them revived. There's great hope here, you guys. I just want you to grab a hold of it, grab a hold of Jesus and stay there. My life has been so good. There's been such hardship and there's been tears and tribulation, but Jesus said, don't be afraid when hardship comes because I've overcome the world. You know, we have Jesus, and um, I just blow wind in your sails today, you guys. Just take the ride with Jesus and keep going. I love you so much. Amen. God bless you guys. How many of you saw the movie, The Jesus Revolution? Oh, come on, you guys gotta watch that movie. It's really a, a, a season of our Christian history as, as men and women of God. And it's really amazing. It's a great depiction of the era Diane was just talking about, where in the Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, Southern California season, literally they were baptizing 300 people every weekend into the kingdom. And right you know, sort of a year after that movie ends in 1972, that's when Diane, a year later, was baptized in that exact same cove by some of those same pastors. And so again, we are on the verge of what could be the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit that has happened in human history. We're gonna talk about that more tonight. But I really want to encourage you to relish the moment you're in as a church. You know, I, I honestly have mentioned your church a hundred times. I've boasted about what God is doing here because it's so extraordinary. This is a, a taste of heaven where all nations, tongues, and to, uh, tribes and kindred come together to worship the King of Kings and to walk in the fullness of his beauty and his uh, power on the earth. And you guys are experiencing it. So don't take it for granted. I just encourage you, like Diane was saying, just appreciate the moment you're in, but know that it's for even such a time as this, that God is gonna expand this, he's gonna impart this, he's going to infect other churches with the same beautiful virus that is here, and I believe it's gonna go to the nations as we sang today. Let, this let your glory fill this place, fill this room, and let it go forth from here to the nations. Amen? That's what Chroma Church is all about. And so anyway, it's an honor to be here. Thank you so much for receiving us. And uh, we are excited to just be able to partner with you for what God is doing. So why don't you open your Bibles and turn with me to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. And, uh, you know, I, Diane and I have been married 43 years. We have seven children, seven grandchildren. And uh, it's been an amazing journey. Um, wonderful, empowering, incredible, but also challenging and difficult, just like all of your lives. It's been that beautiful combination of uh, agony and ecstasy, and uh, God is still real. He's still true. He still has us hit in the palm of his hand. But uh, we met in, uh, gosh, it was 1980, and I was leading an outreach, and uh, Diane was with Youth of the Mission. She came up to San Francisco, that night, I made sure she came on my team as we went out on the streets, and, uh, and we had this interesting encounter with a bunch of angry, drunk individuals and while we were worshiping Jesus, and, uh, and anyway, I held her hand for the first time on the first day I ever met her. I know, it was just like a, just a, a reassuring little, you know, grip of her hand, but then I figured I'd better marry her because I don't want to defraud the girl, you know. I just, anyway, so we got married within six months. And, um, and actually, it was probably a, a, about maybe three months after we were married, we were sitting in our living room doing our morning devotions. And while we were praying, Diane actually had an open vision. Uh, I don't know if you know what that is, but that's when you, with your eyes open, you're seeing another world. You're seeing another uh, uh, supernatural picture. And so she started describing to me this room she was seeing. It was a room about this size, 
and there were uh, rafters in the ceiling, and there was windows on the side, and there was double doors. And, and uh, as she was narrating this vision she was having, she said, and, and I see us, and we're, we're kneeling at the foot of a stage, and uh, there's a man that's praying over us. And she said, now I'm hearing, I'm hearing a voice, and the voice is saying, be diligent to make your call and your election sure. And then the vision just dissipated. It went away. And so when you have a vision like that, you know, she asked me, well, what do you think it means? I said, I don't know. What do you think it means? Well, we didn't know. But about two weeks later, we had a call from our ministry headquarters and they said, Michael and Diane, we would like you to come to our pastor's conference. I said, well, you know, we're still just in training. We have not been ordained yet. They said, oh, yes, we know, but the Lord told us to invite you. And so we signed up for this conference. Three or four weeks later, we end up in, in this uh, retreat center in Santa Cruz, California. And when we walk in the room, Diane grabs me by the arm and says, Michael, this is the room. I said, what are you talking about? Well, this is the room in which, you know, we were in that vision. I said, oh, that's amazing. And so we stood by the side and we watched all the people come in, probably three or 400 people. And, and while we were there, um, you know, we, she said, but I don't see the man that was praying for us. Well, really, the next day, the guest of honor for the rest of the week shows up and Diane says, that's the man. That's, that's the guy praying for us in, in my vision. But you have to understand that this was back in the discipleship movement days, and um, it was very, very strict, controlling church environment. And so if you stepped out of line to get prayer from somebody that was kind of your elder or somebody, a guest speaker, you'd be considered proud. You'd, you'd uh, be accused of having what we called young man syndrome which is where you strive for, you know, attention or recognition or whatever. And so I just, like, I was gun shy. I was not going to do, you know, anything to make this happen. And so I was, you know, Diane, just let's lay it down. It's not going to happen. Let's just enjoy the time. So anyway, that night he preaches on apostles, and they call forth everybody who had been interviewed and vetted to be apostolic. And they prayed over them and ordained them, and that was beautiful. The next morning, he taught on prophecy and the prophetic gift, and then they invited all the people that had been you know, considered and candidated and interviewed and vetted, prayed for each one of them. Then in the afternoon session, they went to evangelists, and he preached on evangelism, and then they called up all the evangelists. And my wife and I were sitting right, right over here, and a man who had just been ordained a prophet ran over to us and said, Michael and Diane, you need to get up there. And I said, David, there is no way in the world I'm going up there. I'm not going to subject myself to the scrutiny, to the judgment, to the, you know, accusation that, who are you? You weren't interviewed. You weren't vetted. What are you doing up here presuming to receive prayer? I'm just not going to do it. And he says, but you're, you're called to be an evangelist, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah, no, I don't think so. That's not my calling. He says, but you're doing the work of an evangelist, aren't you? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, well, get up there. And he grabbed me by my arm and yanked me out of my seat. So I grabbed Diane and yanked her out of her seat. And here we ended up kneeling exactly where she saw us in this vision. And so this guy is going down the row, praying for each one, evangelist, 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 and then he gets to us and he says, wait a minute, you're not called to be an evangelist. And then he paused and it was kind of like, oh no, what am I doing here? I knew I would get busted. I, I, I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. And anyway, he said, no, you're called to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the church. And you're going to be a pastor to pastors and a leader to leaders. And he started talking about our future destiny. And it was just amazing. It was an amazing thing. And then we went back to the scripture that, that was quoted in the vision. And this is what it says. In 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, it says this. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure, 
For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, now this, this promise is incredible, but it's not just to Diane and me. We're just one of thousands, millions of believers who are called by God. In fact, every single person in this room right now every person who's listening to us on streaming, every one of us, the scripture says, has a call from God. Now, when the word call is used in scripture, it's almost always referring to our eternal calling, to be with Jesus forever, that that's the sort of theological framework. But guess what? Eternal life doesn't start the moment you die. Eternal life starts the moment you're born again. You have already entered into your eternal life. You are on the journey. In fact, the scripture says that you are a bi-locational, bi-locational person, that you are right here seated, seated in Chroma Church today in this morning, but you are also simultaneously seated with Jesus in the heavenly realms. You are living out a dual existence because right now you've been left on the earth to fulfill some purpose You've been uniquely designed by God to do things that no one else can do in quite the same way. You're amazing. You are a world changer. You are somebody who's going to influence others for the glory of God and the extension of his kingdom. But at the same time, you need to understand that that's unto something, that God himself has elected you. You know, we're, we're facing an election in the United States. I think you're getting close to one here in the UK. And the fact is, is that, you know, an election, the majority wins in, you know, a d democratic or a republic uh, dynamic, but God is the one who elects. <laughs> and the vote of one is the vote of everything. In other words, he selects you and he also calls you. And the word calling is an interesting word because it means a summons, like a, a king if if King Charles was to write you a personal letter and say, I want you, uh, you know, at, at my healing ceremony after I'm healed from cancer, okay, and you're gonna come to this party, well, you're not gonna say no, okay? He has called you, and, and what the scripture says, though, very interestingly, is it says, therefore, brethren, be diligent. Now, that, that's an interesting word. Diligent requires a degree of effort, a degree of focus, a degree of application. I'm gonna take this seriously. I'm gonna go after this. Be diligent to make your call and your election certain, positive. It is a done deal, but you have to do that. There's a, there's a responsibility that each one of us has to actually engage God and understand that when he chose us, it wasn't just to go to heaven. He chose us not just to go to heaven, but to bring heaven to earth. And we will all do it in different ways. Some of you will do it in business. Some of you will do it in education. Some will do it as a stay-at-home mom or a stay-at-home dad. Some of us will do it in the medical field. Some of that will, us will do that in this church by serving and by blessing and by, or some of you will do it as church planters, that each one of us has a unique and different calling but ultimately, it's all unto the glory of God and the extension of his kingdom. But there's an interesting little word that is right here at the beginning where it says in verse 10, therefore. And if you've been around preachers for any amount of time, you know that when you see the word therefore, you find out what it's there for, okay? And so you have to go back a little bit. You have to go reverse into the passage a little bit to find out what is he saying? Why is it so important that we make our call and our election sure? Now, let me just say one thing as we go forth here is that you may not have had some prophetic word. You may not have had an open vision. You may not have had you know, some other revelation or, you know, somebody prophesying over you, let me just say this. That does not mean that you do not have a God-given calling. In fact, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 is very clear that we are his workmanship being created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before ordained that we would walk in them. 
Now, what that word, you, you've probably heard teaching on this many times, but the word workmanship that God is fashioning us, we're like a painting that God is painting, or we're like a sculpture that God is forming, or, or we're like a, um, you know, a song that God is writing. In fact, the word that is used there in the Greek is the word poema, which is from, we, we derive the word poem, that you're the song that God is writing. But what's interesting is we can think of that in some general sense. Yes, we, we all read the Bible. Yes, we all pray. Yes, we all witness to our friends. We go to church. We give money. Like, these are the general works of God that every believer is engaged in, and those are wonderful things. But I believe the passage itself is indicating not the general works, but the specific works. How do I know? Because the final verse says this, the final phrase says, God ordained it beforehand. In other words, God knew you. He formed you in your mother's womb, according to Psalm 139. He actually, it says that he, all your days were written in his book when as yet there were none of them, that God himself has shaped you. He's worked through every season of your life, even the most horrible circumstances. God has been present to redeem those things, even the most joyous, wonderful seasons of your life. God has worked in those things to actually shape you and form you and even produce inside of you passions and dreams that God alone has authored. He brought you to himself through a unique process that is different from anyone else. There was, you know, if you think about why did I choose Jesus or why did he choose me? Ultimately, if you compare that to any other person in this room, it'll be slightly different because he had a unique journey for you. You were called by him and every one of us, whether you know it or not, whether your, your, your promise, the dream is just a, an infant thing in your life, a very small baby that's in the cradle, or whether you've been a believer for 10 or 20 or 30 years and you've already put most of your promises away, you've, you've buried them in the soil of your life because of disappointment and difficulty, regardless, God's promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. But look at, look at verse two and three and four. Okay, go down there. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And then look at verse three. As his divine power has given to us all things. In other words, his divine power has already given you past tense. When you came to Christ, you received everything that you need to become everything that God has called you to be. I mean, it's just so shockingly uh, crazy abundant. Hello? You guys <laughs> tracking with me here? Because this is the word of the Lord, that God has a purpose for his people and the greatest uh, Fulfillment in life is discovering and fulfilling the very thing for which God created you. And he's already given you every single resource you need according to this passage. His divine power has given you all things that pertain to life and to godliness through the knowledge of him who called you by glory and virtue. In other words, he's already come across your bank account. He's already invested you know, 10 million pounds in your bank account. He said, whatever you need, draw on this resource and I will bless you. Uh, unfortunately, some of us have lost our PIN number and we, we can't seem to find it. But in fact, God says, no, these resources are there and I'm gonna train you how to access them. The gifts, the calling, the anointing, the blessing. You're gonna be able to lay hold of these things, even the financial resource to fulfill the dream that God has given you. All those things have been laid in store for you. But look at the next verse. He says this. By these things, by virtue and glory, he has given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, one of the things I celebrate about Chroma Church again and again is the testimony of salvations that are going on in this church. 
I mean, what an incredible thing in a time where most churches are not winning souls at even a level that stays current with population growth. You guys are seeing breakthrough in this area. It's wonderful, and I believe it's for you, and I believe it's for Lester as well, but I believe it's ultimately for the whole body of Christ. I believe there's an equipping ministry that's gonna come out of this place that is actually gonna be not just equipping in terms of a model, but equipping in terms of anointing that is gonna actually revolutionize the body of Christ around this nation and around the nations of the world. Because this is where the greatest deficit is. This is where the greatest lack is in the body of Christ, is the winning of souls, the plundering of hell, and the populating of heaven. I mean, this is such a gift that God has placed in your hands. Amen? Let's give him glory. Come on, let's just thank him. This is just awesome. What amazing leaders that God has given you to guide you into this place. But look again at verse four. Okay, it says this. God has given each one of us exceeding great and precious promises. What is he saying? Well, we all have the same promises of being cleansed from our sins, of being born again, of, of going to heaven and being with him forever, that we have this amazing heritage that we have in Christ that is filled with so many good things that we all share. They're part of the common grace that we all have received. But then I believe he's also not just talking about the general promises, but specific promises. Like, what has God promised you in your future? What has God promised to each one of us? I believe he gives us specific promises. To Diane and I, you know, in that vision, he gave us a promise, and that promise has actually kept us in the pathway of heaven for our whole lives. Because guess what? Life throws curveballs curve at you. You're going after a promise and all of a sudden you hit a brick wall. All of a sudden you're sideswiped by a, a bus, okay? It's like we find ourselves in a situation where the pathway to the fulfillment of all that God has promised you is not a straight beeline pathway. There's curves and there's, there's bumps in the road and there's difficulties and challenges. I mean, when we first received these words, we thought, wow, God's gonna move us forward. A few years later, we met John Wimber. He was traveling with a man named Lonnie Frisbee. It changed our whole trajectory. We started hanging out with these guys and we got anointed in the Holy Spirit. We started seeing healings and breakthroughs and deliverances. And then the Lord called us to plant a vineyard church in San Francisco. And we started in 1984 and within, gosh, 10 years, we had more than 1,000 people, which San Francisco had never seen. It wasn't because of us. It was because of the promise of God on our lives. But at the same time, we went through some challenges. A couple of our family members were hurt really badly, and it knocked us off balance and we found our, our marriage going through some difficult times. And we, and we found our ability to lead, even though the church was taking off like this, our family was going through deep, deep challenges. Some of you have experienced these kinds of things. Some of you have found yourself on a fast track with God, but then you get sideswiped or you, get, you hit a brick wall. And you find that the very things that you thought were going to be easy become incredibly challenging and difficult. And then disappointment sets in. Hope deferred makes your heart sick. And we find ourselves moving into a place of despondency or pain or ultimately just allowing those dreams that God gave us to just die. And then we, have a, we bury them and we put a tombstone and we say, you know what, this far, no further. Well, today I believe it's a day to resurrect Fallen dreams. I believe today is a day where you'll be able to resurrect those things that God has said to you over the years that maybe you just finally gave up on because the challenges were too great. But I believe it's time for us to see those things emerge again. Amen? And so I want to encourage you as we look at Scripture to see that God has given you promises, but you are the steward. So think of a man named Abraham and a woman named Sarah. Okay, their original name was not Abraham and Sarah, it was Abram and Sarai. And Abram meant father. 
Okay, because he had received a promise from God. God has said, leave your people, leave your land. I'm gonna bring you to a new land and I'm gonna give you a child. And through your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So he was given this incredible promise, he and his wife together, and yet five years passes and they have no son. And he turns to God and says, God, why don't you let my servant be my heir to the throne? Let, let my servant be my son. God says, nope, that's not my plan. Okay, another five years pass, and, uh, and Sarah gets a great idea. Why don't you sleep with my handmaiden? She'll give birth on my lap, and that will be our son. And of course, that was a pretty bad idea, and it's left, you know, 2,000 years of problems have emerged from that particular mistake. How many of you have made mistakes trying to do God's will in, in your own way and in your own power? And so again, they blew it again. And then a little bit later in the process, God tells them to change their name. So he changes his name from Abram, which means father, to Abraham, which is father of many nations. Well, that's a little presumptuous, wouldn't you say? It's like, wow, you're the father of, so it's like, you know, Sarah's calling him in for dinner. Hey, Abraham. <laughs> She used to call him, Abram, father, come to dinner. Now she's saying, father of many nations, come to dinner. Okay, everybody's like, yeah, right. I've heard that before. I mean, it's easy to get cynical. It's easy to get skeptical when the promise of God has not come to pass in the timetable that you had set. It's easy to allow disappointment. But here we finally find Abraham and Sarah encountering the Lord. And he says, this time next year, your son's gonna be born. Do you realize it was 25 years later? He was 75 when the promise came. He was 100 when it was fulfilled. And then 15 years later, God says, take now your son, your only son, and bring him up on the mountain and kill him. In other words, God wanted to always make sure that he was first even above the promise. Amen? But here we see this incredible picture. Or we see the picture of Moses, who spent 40 years, you know, in Pharaoh's house, and then he makes a big boo-boo, and he turns out to have 40 years in the wilderness where God is reshaping him and finally sending him back to fulfill the destiny that God had given him. You're going to deliver my people. Or think about David, who had 17 years of preparation where he had to run from Saul the whole time. Or think about Esther, who was captured as a sex slave. She was given to the king to test, test her out, and he had favor for her. She becomes the queen of the land and is able to deliver her people. But it took place over a long period of time with much heartache. Think about Daniel who was captured as a young man and castrated and, and made a eunuch. And yet he serves the Lord faithfully and transforms a nation, a, a Babylonian nation, into a kingdom expression that actually delivers God's people. And think about each of the promises of God throughout Scripture. And then think about the promise of God to you. How have you been able to steward how have you pushed away the vultures that have sought to consume the sacrifice you set before the Lord? Or maybe you haven't. Maybe you've just kind of given up at times like I have. Times where I just sort of said, I, I can't, I, there's no way I can see it happening, God. I just, you know, I have to let go. I want to cover one story and then we're going to close. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 105. And we're going to look at a man named Joseph. Now, you know Joseph had a dream. In fact, his dream was very specific that his brothers, his 11 brothers, would bow down and give him honor. Okay, now that was a stupid dream to talk about because his brothers were very jealous. There was a lot of sibling rivalry. And then the next dream he had, his brothers bowed down and his parents bowed down. And so he's like, he put his foot in it pretty badly. And then when he ended up, went, went out on, on a mission from his dad to check on the brothers, they decided to kill him. And then they said, well, let's don't kill him. Let's make a few bucks. Let's sell him into slavery. He goes down into Potiphar's house. He's purchased by Potiphar as a slave. And he ends up, because of his nobility, because of his excellence, he becomes the second in the household. 
And he rises up, but then he's accused falsely of attempted rape. And he's thrown into the dungeon. Could you imagine this guy's life? Here he is. He has great expectations. He has a dream of being the best, of being the, the chief among his brothers, and life goes an opposite direction. And here he is having to pick himself up as a slave and then, and then being thrown into dungeon and having to deal with that. And then he has this amazing advantage. The cupbearer and the baker come in and he interprets their dream and then he finds himself saying to them, please, when you get back before Pharaoh, please remember me. I'm here because I was falsely accused. And they forget him for another couple of years. Could you imagine being in that position? Well, I guess you can. Because all of us have had promises that did not come to pass the way we thought they would. This is the normal Christian life, you guys. And yet... At a certain point, the baker remember, or the cupbearer remembered, and the cupbearer said, I know a guy who can interpret your dream, Pharaoh. And they called him in, they shaved him, they gave him a bath out of the dungeon, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. And Pharaoh says, well, who else can lead this particular project? It's you, Joseph. And Joseph rises up, and there's literally, if you think about it, like 21 years before, between the promise and the ultimate moment where his brothers, after seven years of plenty and then three or four years of famine, come before him and bow down. The dream is fulfilled. But look what it says here. It says in Psalm 105, verse 16, he called for a famine in the land. And he's talking about God. God brought a famine in the land. He destroyed the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. See, God is taking responsibility for the entire process of giving a promise, but then having that promise go sideways. But here we are at this moment where God says this. It says, they hurt his feet with fetters, and he was laid in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. In other words, there was a promise that was given, but until the time that the promise came to pass, until the time that his brothers finally came before him and bowed down, the word of the Lord actually had a process of transformation inside of Joseph. It's as if the Lord hooked him with a promise, like, like a big hunk of meat, and then drew him down the conveyor belt while the saws were going to saw off all of the garbage, all of the sinfulness, all the pride, all of the ego, getting cut away until the, the heart of Joseph was ready to carry the promise of Joseph. Until the word of the Lord came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. Until the character, it, it, think of it like an anvil in, in a, in a, in a uh, you know, shop where somebody's hammering out a sword. That sword requires something to hammer against. God has been using the promise in your life as an anvil to hammer into your life the character of Jesus so that ultimately you can be the quality of person that can carry the beautiful promise that God has given us. So we need to become stewards. In fact, the final verse I'll share is out of 1 Timothy 1.18, where Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he says to him, stir up the gift that was given you. Through prophecy, through the laying on of my hands, Take the thing that was spoken over your life. And then a little bit later he says, and fight the good fight of faith. In other words, engage it like a battle that you have to fight for the fulfillment of what God has promised in your life. And it's the process of stewarding the promise of God that produces two things. One is the transformation of your character into the image of Jesus. And the other one is the fulfillment of the promise that will produce the fruitfulness that God has ordained. Amen?
Amen. Pastor, could you come on up and hallelujah. Why don't you stand? How good is that? We're going we're gonna to pray for some of these promises in a minute, okay? But first, we, we always give an opportunity for people to come to Jesus. Somebody may have brought you here today. Um, you may have um, come on your own, your own steam. Maybe many years ago, you gave your life to Jesus. But for whatever purpose, things have gone, gone astray. Or maybe you've never done it. But we're, we're, we're talking about the, the promises, the plans that God has from before the creation of the world for every single person here. But the first thing of entering the promise is to cash the cheque that Jesus paid. So when Jesus came and died on the cross, He gave His life for each one of us so our sin could be forgiven and that we could have relationship with God. And that's where it starts. That's where all the promises come and that's where it all starts to get released in our life. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm going to give you an opportunity now. So if you know you need to come to the Lord Jesus, you want to step into everything He has planned for you, but this is the first step. It's the starting gun for the rest of your life. Come on down. So where are you? We're, we we want to move on because we want to pray for some people, but we're going to, we always do this first. You, you know you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus. You know you need Him in your life. It's time for a ch- turnaround. He says, repent. And that's turn 180 degrees. Come on down. Come on down. It's time for a change. Where are you? Come on. Today is the day. He lays these things on. He gathers so that you will know Him. Come on. Welcome. What's your name? Brilliant. Brilliant. Welcome. We're going to pray in a moment. Who else? Come on. This is, this is your day. This is why Jesus came. Turn lives around. God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Whoever believes in Him, He gives a right to become children of God. Come on, where are you? We're going to pray for Billy in a minute, but come on, where are you? I know right now your feet feel like lead, but I'm praying, Lord, make them like fire. Okay, Lord, make them like fire. Come on down. I'm waiting a few more moments. Where are you? I know there's some more this morning. This is the, this is the, the decision that changes everything. This is the first step of the rest of our lives. I think Michael, Michael said, eternity starts today. The day we give our life to Jesus. Where are you? coming to give your life to Jesus. Welcome. Okay, we're going to pray. Is there anyone else?
Okay, what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to say a prayer. Would you say this out loud? They're all going to say it as well. Okay, Lord Jesus, I thank You for that You came to earth to live for me so that I could know the Father. I ask that You would forgive me, that You would take my sin to the cross and You would give me a new life. I believe in You. I put my trust in You. And I will now follow You all the days of my life. So I open up my heart and I ask You to come in. Amen. Now, why don't you just hold your hands out as if you were gonna receive a gift. Okay, just hold, that's it. And I'm gonna pray that. And you ladies all stretch out your hands. Lord Jesus, we just pray that You would you would come in and You would fill them with Your Holy Spirit and that, that Your cleansing power would come and that You would remove our sin as far as the East is from the West and that we would know Your love. So come Lord, come Lord, come Lord, come Lord. Fill Him, fill Him up. Fill them up in the Name of Jesus. Receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. More, Lord. More. More. From His head to His feet. Head to His feet. Come, Holy Spirit. Fill Him. Fill Him. Everything changes from now. Power to live. Power to live. Power to live. You have no idea, TZ, about the adventure you, you have signed up to the God of the heavens who has your life in His hands. And we bless You. We bless You. They're going to keep praying for a moment. Okay. If you're, if you're here this morning and the, 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 what Michael was talking about, the, the promises of God, okay? And, and you want, you're, 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 you're willing to really nurture these promises. You, you know that God has spoken to you and that you're willing to, to, to nurture them and to, to run after that elect call. Come on down, come on down, come on. Some of you, some of you have, um, have had promises for years and years and you've, you've let them go to ground. Come on down. They're gonna get resurrected this morning. Come on. And Michael's gonna pray over you, but come on. Yes, Lord. We have two groups that we wanna pray for this morning. Those of you who have had the promise of God in your life, it was, it was part of what, what drove you to serve the Lord with all your heart. And then you hit a point of disappointment. If that's you, put your hand up right now. Those of you who have hit those moments of disappointment, you finally said, I don't know how to move forward from here. If that's you still in the congregation, please come forward right now. We wanna see a breakthrough on this side. But also for those of you who are actually younger, and, you've, and you, you believe what I'm saying, that you have a promise over your life, but somehow it got stolen, it got, it got damaged. Some words were spoken over you that gave you, uh, uh, like, why would I even hope for a future? I'll never buy a house, I'll never get married, I'll never, with it, that somehow the, the message of this world has robbed you of your dreams. If that's you, put your hand up. If you felt that degree of hopelessness as a young person in our midst, Lord, we wanna break that off of you today. We wanna see God re release you. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you are the God of promises, Lord, that all the promises of heaven are yes and amen in Christ. And right now we silence the voice that is spoken over these young people right now. Whatever has robbed you of your future, whatever has robbed you of your hope, we break it now in Jesus' name. Now just put your hand on your forehead. Those of you who want that broken off of you and just say, I break that off of me now in Jesus' name. I serve the God of hope. 
I serve the God of future things. I serve the God of promises. And I receive the promises of God afresh in my life. In Jesus' name, I receive the promises of God afresh. Hallelujah, Lord. Break it off now and release them into a new day, a new experience of hope and restoration. And for those of you who have had your dreams die because you have found yourself in a place where disappointment is set in, that I want to just bless you right now. And Father, I pray for resurrection, resurrection of the dreams, resurrection of the hope. Lord, roll the stone away. Lord, cause the hope to rise up and come forth from the tomb like Lazarus. And Lord, that you would restore dead dreams, destroyed dreams, damaged dreams, and that you, Father, would restore hope. Lord, you said hope deferred makes our hearts sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. Um, you, you've had prophesied over you that you would get married and you're, you're older and you haven't. And I, I, I just want, wherever you stand, Lord, your promises are true. And Lord, I, I pray that those promises will not drop to the ground and that you would, you would um, raise their faith and raise their expectations and that, Lord, you would find them husbands and wives. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would do this. If you said it, Lord, you will do it. So I pray, restore, restore the hope and restore the promise, I pray, in the name of, in the name of Jesus. Yeah, if you're receiving prayer, stay in this place. We're gonna finish in worship but if you've not got your kids go get them bring them into worship but just to let you know a few things happening this week so Michael will be back this evening so come along to the evening service if you've got kids get them signed up to our um, holiday club and also if you want to join the new life team the 15th of February come and do the taster session but we are going to go out worshiping King Jesus so step forward bring your kids forward we're going to worship the Lord
kids, you've gone and got them. And we probably won't have an official ending, we'll just all we'll worship for a little bit. So if you need to go, you can go. Um, and if you want to stay, we'll go for a little bit longer. But make sure you get your kids, make sure you say thank you to the children's workers. <laughs>
Let's give him one shot, press. Snatch your cheese. Oh, how we love. Hey, so look, we got more church tonight, 5.30. Michael's back. We'll worship a whole lot more. Love you all. See you there. If not next week.